Okay. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Uh, I'm Vu Tran. I teach fiction here in the program Creative Writing, and uh, thank you everyone for coming tonight. We are, are so very happy to have uh, Percival Everett here as our 2018 Kessenbaum uh, visiting writer. The Kessenbaum Writer in Residence program is the highlight of our uh, reading series every year, and I just want to take a second to uh, thank Kate Kessenbaum and the Kessenbaum family for uh, their wonderful generosity and support, especially uh, to creative writing the last uh, almost decade, over decade. So uh, let me uh, introduce um, Professor Everett. I think it's uh, actually very fitting that for uh, the very first year of our creative writing major, which I'm thrilled to say has been incredibly popular beyond our own uh, high expectations, but it's very fitting this year that our, our Kessenbaum writer is himself uh, a longtime teacher of creative writing. First of all, Everett has been teaching for over 30 years, the last almost 20 at the uh, uh, University of Southern California, uh, where he also teaches classes on critical theory and teaches on film and American studies. Over the course of his career, he has written almost 30 books, uh, mostly novels, but also short stories, uh, poetry, and even a children's book. Among his many honors, he has won the Believer Book Award, the Dos Passos Literature Prize, the Houston Wright Legacy Award, a Guggenheim Fellowship, and a Penn USA Literary Award. Now, this is the first time I've met uh, Professor Everett, so I, I don't know him personally. But from his very, uh, his impressive body of work, uh, one can assume beyond talent, uh, beyond an amazing work ethic, a very nimble and restless mind uh, that is constantly looking for, uh, seems to me, a more compelling way of, of looking at the world. I'm going to give you a list, and he might actually not like me characterizing it this way, but he has written what some would call, at least in part, westerns, crime novels, comic novels, uh, political satires, uh, retellings of Greek myths. Um, he's written a novel narrated by a baby genius who has read all of western philosophy while still in diapers. He's written a novel that centers around a deceased and decapitated man who comes back to life at his funeral. Uh, he has written a novel called A History of the African American People, proposed by Strom Thurmond, as told to Percival Everett and James Kincaid. Uh, I'm just going to leave you with that tile to whet your curiosity. His fiction often touches or revolves around the issue of re race, at least on the surface, but to classify him as an African American writer is to classify his work under only one genre, and that grossly reduces its power and its reach. If there's a recurrent concern in his fiction, it seems to be the absurd realities of American culture. Uh, if there's one unifying aesthetic impulse, it's the refusal to adhere to rules or categories or the expectations of anyone. His most recent novel, So Much Blue, uh, one of my absolute favorite novels from the last few years, it seems to illustrate this impulse. It uh, concerns a 56-year-old abstract painter who <clears throat> happens to be African-American and in his idyllic life with his wife and two kids, uh, is working on a secret painting that he has shown no one, not his best friend, not his kids, not even his wife. But he has two other big secrets, which he tells us in alternating flashbacks throughout the novel. Uh, one is his affair 10 years before with a 22-year-old uh, painter in Paris. And the second secret is his traumatic trip to El Salvador 20 years before that to help his best friend find his missing brother. Um, and so in this one novel, we find three different novels, uh, three different narrative impulses. But Everett weaves all three together seamlessly uh, to create what I think is this brilliant, uh, often very funny, often deeply moving story uh, on the ambiguous and elusive nature of happiness. One thing I kept asking myself as I read the novel was, uh, why do people keep secrets from others? It's out of privacy, out of shame, out of need to... Uh, control life. And what the novel seemed to tell me was, well, we keep secrets because uh, we never truly know what happiness is. This novel is about much more than that, but it feels animated by that question and leaves us, um, and I'm not ruining anything here, it leaves us with a happy ending uh, that might not be happy at all. Uh, and that to me is the perfect kind of ending, um, at least for a novel. Anyway, I'm really pleased we were able to bring him uh, here to the University of Chicago. So if you can, uh, please help me welcome Percival Everett.
Well, thank you for that introduction, Trent. That was, was very nice. Um, and thank you for having me. And I'd like to thank Starsha for taking such good care of me. And, um, and say that right off the bat, I, I never know about readings. And, and I never know what I'm going to read because it takes me a while to make friends with, with, my, with my books. Sometimes I, I never do. Uh, so before I read, and I, I mentioned telling a story and Trent's eyes lit up, and, and I, I'm going to read briefly from, I think, uh, So Much Blue, but I'm going to tell you a story that I've told before. Uh, and I use it a, a, as an instructive story about the nature of, of, of my work as a, as a fiction writer. I'll preface this by, by saying it's, it's I, I always tell my students, my fiction writing students, that if they ever use the excuse um, or the justification for a story or a scene, but it really happened, that we the class will collectively throw them through the window. Um, fact is, it, maybe it did happen, maybe it didn't, I don't care. I don't want to know about it. Uh, but this really happened. And, and for 12 years, it ruined my life. Every six months for 12 years, I would try to turn this story I'm about to tell you into a work of fiction. Uh, and every six months, I would fail miserably and, until finally I wrote perhaps the worst story I've ever written and published it just so I would never have to think about this story again. Uh, <laughs> And so here is the, here is the story. It, 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 this takes place in, um, in, in Idaho. And has anyone here ever been to Idaho? Uh, yeah, well, then you probably know that, that I became known as the black guy by driving through Idaho. <laughs> and, um, and to give you a, I have a, a, a preface story to tell you that will give you an idea of what this part of the country is like. And I love this part of the country. Um, I was. I was working ranches in, in Idaho, and, um, and I was delivering cows. I was driving a truck and delivering cows to someone in Baker, Oregon. And I parked the truck and had to find the man's house so he could tell me where to take the cows. And I stopped a woman on the street and I asked her, I said, can you tell me where this address is? And she looked at me and had a curious slip of the tongue. She said, yes, it's three blacks that way. To which I responded, it can't be nearly that far. <laughs> um, um, so that was, that's the, the, the region. I was working at a ranch um, outside of the town of Council, Idaho, in southern Utah, uh, a population two. And, uh, and I was at this, there was a man on this ranch who um, had a handlebar mustache. Um, I'd never seen one. Now you see them everywhere. Uh, but I thought that was pretty cool. But he couldn't get used to the fact that I was black and in Idaho. And so he was always asking me if I had Indian blood in me. But he would ask in a rather colorful cowboy way, you got any Indian blood in you, he would say. And I'd say, no. Uh, then one day I was castrating bulls, and I know that sounds bad. Um, but it's better than having it be the other way around. And um, I was there was a man working the squeeze gate and I was cutting off parts and giving injections and turning the, the now steers loose. And a uh, handlebar mustache came over and he said to me, you sure you ain't got no Indian blood in you? And I finally said, you know, if you weren't busy studying your ropes all the time, you, you could see I'm black. And I'd insulted his abilities as a cowboy. Um, and he stormed off. And the man working the squeeze gate said, well, you got him a good one. And a couple of guys in the fence laughed. And I thought, great, I, ca I can die now. So I went back to the bunkhouse. I was putting my clothes into my bag. I was, you work ranches. It's terribly boring and, and, and tedious work. Uh, not glamorous at all. Not romantic at all. And I was, I was very excited to leave this place to go into town and do my laundry and maybe watch a baseball game on TV it being summer. And I was excited, and I hate baseball. Um, and so I, I, I was collecting my clothes, and the cook, a man, and in my memory I call him Carol, came in with his, um, Carol had one leg, um, and he used those 
kinds of crutches with the cuff and the handle. And he came in and, and he, he wondered if I would be eating dinner there. And I said, no. And he said, well, nobody is. And he started to wander off. He seemed kind of dejected. And I, I said, well, Carol, well, why don't you come into town with me? I'm going to uh, just get a, you know, do my laundry and watch a ball game on TV. He said, no, it's okay. And I said, we could, we could split the room. He said, well, all right. That's how he talked. And he met me out at my truck in a brand new pair of jeans, leg pinned up, corduroy sport coat. Carol was looking good. He got into the passenger side of my truck, and as we're driving into town, the sun was coming through the windshield, and um, I put my visor down, and I noticed that he didn't put his down because he wasn't looking through the window. He's looking down in his lap where he was doing something with a handkerchief. And I wondered what he was doing with a handkerchief in my truck. And I looked over, and he had his teeth out and he was cleaning his dentures. As you can well imagine, I didn't say anything. I, I let that go, and I didn't know what one does with dentures. And he, um, we got into town where I parked, and we checked into it. Then this, it became a weird story where we walked through a huddle of, of uh, Belgian tourists, very confused uh, Belgian tourists who were in Council, Idaho, um, uh, heard merit a lot because um, they did not want to be in Council Idaho uh, and we went in we got our room checked in and, and it was at the top of the stairs we came down went out to eat at a Chinese restaurant the, the west in little towns is peppered with, with Chinese restaurants because of the, the railroad and, 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 and they're often the only good places to eat in town uh, and we ate, and we left the town and walked down the street to a tavern where we shot pool. Carol shot with one of his crutches that he made a big pretense of chalking up the big rubber tip. Um, and he was pretty good until the beer he was drinking started to take hold and he started to grow unsteady on his leg. And I suggest that maybe it was time to stop beer and sit down. And Carol took this to mean it was time to sit down and start drinking whiskey. And so we sat down and, and Carol got was pretty well drunk by the time Handlebar Mustache came into the, the bar with another cowboy and a woman who had applied her makeup with a palette knife and saw, saw us sitting in the booth and made a beeline for us. Uh, and, and he says something that sounded eloquent when he said it, but when I say it, it sounds like too many words in my mouth. He said, I see you two fellers are so ugly, you couldn't find anybody but each other to hang out with. I thought that was reasonable and fairly true. Um, I, I, I had no, Carol, being either more or less inebriated than I thought, uh, looked past him at the people with whom he'd entered the bar and said, I see the same as true of you, at yeah, which time a, a shouting match ensued. Carol stood up on his leg, and they started barking at each other the way men, stupid mammals, do. and um, and and being even dumber than they, I suppose, I stood between them. What possesses a 20-year-old idiot uh, to stand between two grown men who want to fight like this? I don't know why anyone does it. But it became clear fairly quickly that they were only going to bark. And when I looked at Carol, he turned um, red and passed out. And I caught him, and I carried Carol uh, uh, being somewhat lighter than some people because of the missing leg, uh, over my shoulder and uh, down two doors to the hotel, motel thing, where we were staying, past the Belgian tourists, who at least now had something to put on their postcards, which they'd seen the only black man within a thousand mile radius carrying a man up to his room. And we got up there and I dumped him onto his bed and um, went and sat by the window and marveled at what a nice time I was having when I heard gurgling, and the gurgling was not coming from me, it was in fact coming from Carol, and I walked over and I saw that his teeth had turned in his mouth. Now, you work ranches and you touch a lot of things. I have touched blood, dung, I have reached into uh, horses and, and, and cows and turned offspring around to pull them out. But to reach into the mouth of another person who is not your kid is a big deal. And for me it was. And, but I was afraid that he was going to choke to death on these teeth. 
and leave me to explain his body to the constable of Council Idaho. So I reached in and I removed his teeth and put them on the nightstand, leaped over his bed and went and disappeared one of those pathetic wafers of soap they give you in, in, in motels and went back. I lay down on the bed and, and must have drifted off to sleep because I awoke and was startled by the sight of his teeth. And I sat up and realized he was still alive. I was relieved and collected my clothes and left the room. I went down the, the, the street did my laundry in the laundromat, talked to a little Grovant girl who was, who, was, who was running around, her mother was folding clothes at the other end, when a man who was always on the streets of council, no matter what the temperature, hot or cold, wearing an army fatigue jacket came in, um, looking for quarters or any loose change and, and um, made the, the native woman nervous. I gave him some coins and he left. I um, collected my clothes, went back to the room opened the door and realized and saw that the curtains had been pulled off the windows. The drapes were on the, on the um, floor. One mattress was on the floor, one was askew. There were blankets everywhere and Carol was hopping around in his underwear. I had been to college by this point and, and I was able to deduce that something was wrong. <laughs> I, said, I said, Carol, um, what's wrong? And he, he looked at me and said, I can't find my dentures. And, and I said, Mind you, here's a man who consumed milk directly from its source on a dare, um, if you know what I mean. Um, and I told him that I had to remove his teeth because he was choking, and he grew faint and hopped back, sat on a box spring, and looked at me. And I said, I thought you were choking, and I put them on the nightstand. And, he said, and without looking back, he said, well, they ain't there now. I walked to the nightstand and I looked and they were not on the nightstand. They were not under the nightstand, they were not under the beds, they were not under the carpet behind the nightstand. And I said, I put them right here. This is when this man ruined my life for 12 years. He looked me straight in the eye and this is what he said. My grinners, my grinners, somebody done stole my grinners. <laughs> I thought, I thought, wow. That is beautiful. And this is all going on in my head. I thought, not in a thousand years would I have come up with that. And I opened my mouth and I said, I'll look outside. <laughs> I left the room and stood in the hallway and wondered how, and then I went outside, I leaned on the wall wondering how one, how long one pretends to look for street, teeth in the street. When the guy from the um, uh, laundromat came walking up to me and he said something that I didn't understand, which was not unusual, mind you, because I, could never I never understood what he was saying, but he sounded different and I said, say something else. And into his own hand he spat dentures. And I said, where did you get those? He said, I bought them off this feller. I said, well, how much did you pay? He said, a dollar. I said, I will give you five dollars for those. And he said, beautiful line, they don't fit no way. And he put them in my hand. <laughs> and I ran through the lobby into the laboratory, uh, to the washroom downstairs right next to the desk. And I remember this, this, this washroom so, so well. There's three sinks, two stalls. That still confuses me. Um, <laughs> and a, a shared sill and one shared mirror with, uh, by, uh, at the sinks. And I was standing at the middle sink washing my hands maniacally when one of the Belgians came out of a stall and stood beside me washing his, and washed his hands. And he, he looked in the mirror and smiled and I saw him and I smiled back. Well, they weren't my teeth that were sitting on the sill. And he looked at me and sprinted out of the bed, because obviously the only black man in a thousand mile radius was killing people and stealing their prosthetic <laughs> devices. I collected the teeth in a nest of paper towels and carried them upstairs and presented them to Carol rather unceremoniously. I think I said, here are your damn teeth. And he said, where did you find them? Which was a reasonable question. And as I rethought this story for 12 years, every six months, I kept seeing this as maybe my place of moral dilemma that I might be able to turn this into a, into a story. But I lied. I said, they were on the curb. Damnedest thing you've ever seen. He said, really? And it was not a satisfying answer. And, and 
but it was the only answer he was getting, and he went to the washroom, rinsed them off, rather cursorily for my taste, and put them into his face. Now, a man ought to know his own teeth, and he said to me, the only thing that probably could have been unnerving or unsettling, he said, they feel funny. And I thought, oh my God, they're not his teeth. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I mean, aren't they branded in some way? Shouldn't your teeth you know, have your initials on them? But, and we never said another word about it. We don't, I never found out what happened. We never talked about it. Um, I assumed that handlebar mustache came into the room for some unknown reason and thought this was funny. I do not know. But for 12 years, I tried to make that a piece of fiction. And it was uh, a really good lesson for me. And I couldn't uh, because I liked the story. I love the story. I can tell the story and it's amusing, it's somewhat funny, but I couldn't do my job. I'm a fiction writer. My job is to create a world, not report it. So every time I went to work, I was handcuffed by what I knew. Um, I didn't want to write an amusing story, an anecdote. I couldn't make it do anything beyond the mere telling of events. So I wrote this terrible story to just get it away from me. So that's the, um, the teeth story, as we call it. And I'm going to read portions of, of, of So Much Blue. And I'm going to jump around so that I stay with one of the stories. Um, and this is uh, in, um, a set in El Salvador. And I, I guess the only setup I need to, to, to give you is uh, um, Richard, the, the main character, Kevin's best friend, has come to him concerned about his brother, who is, as we say, turned up missing uh, after having gone to El Salvador. And they are taking a trip He's going with his friend Richard to um, look for him. Uh, the airport in San Salvador was small and acutely busy, looking more like a bowling alley than anything else. Soldiers in their olive drab uniforms and ca camouflage caps paraded with some swagger back and forth in front of the area where the bags were not mechanically conveyed but tossed from carts into the middle of the room. This is 1979, by the way. We grabbed our bags and walked through the entry point, essentially unchecked, but extremely noticed. Our lack of Spanish seemed to annoy people less than I had imagined it would. I sensed certainly that we were filthy Americans and that our age and appearance suggested that we might have been there for a rather limited range of reasons or ventures, but possibly for the latter reason we buzzed through customs with merely a nod and still zip duffels. As my passport was stamped with each with, it, with only a fleeting, but no less reproving glance, I had the feeling that I had been there before, that I, would not, that I would be there again, not in that country, but passing unregistered, however noted, through a station that was memorable, perhaps profound yet immaterial, but not completely nugatory. Back then, in my more sincere, naive, or wet behind the ears artistic self, I might have chosen the word unavailing, the important part is that I would not have cared if I was right or wrong. Outside, while we, were waiting for, while we waited for the taxi, several kids danced to a blaring tape of the village people singing in the Navy. That's just wrong, Richard said. I was sad that I sort of liked it. The tune was still in my head when the taxi let us out in front of the American embassy. Annoying as it was, I almost sang the song aloud as I looked across the huge traffic roundabout at the Grand Fountain. The embassy itself, though large, was not so grand, looking more like a rectangular layer cake than anything else. We showed our passports to a refrigerator-shaped Marine who was no more moved or interested in us than the customs agents had been. He waved us into the compound. Richard told the man at the desk why we were there, that we were looking for his brother, that nothing had been heard from, from, him, from him in months that the fear was that he might have been arrested and left to rot in some jail or dungeon someplace. In my opinion, 
Richard was talking too much, but I didn't interrupt. We sat there for just over an hour before another man came out to us. I thought he looked alarmingly similar to the first man. He was tall, nearly handsome, blonde. He wore a, um, an air of dismissal that wafted in front of him like so much cologne. He sat in a chair across from us in the waiting area. Richard repeated his speech about why we were there. By this time, he added the bit about the hospital before mentioning that he worried his brother was festering in a cell somewhere. And just what might your brother be, have been arrested for? I don't know if he's been arrested, Richard stammered. I only offer that as a possibility. We haven't heard from him in so long. He could, just as I said, be in the hospital someplace. But you did say jail. Why do you think he'd be in jail? Has your brother ever been arrested? Yes. Where? In Baltimore and Philadelphia. Boston, I added. And yes, Boston, Richard said. And I don't see what this has to do with anything. I see. And what was he arrested for? Richard let out a long breath and leaned back in his chair. A couple of times for possession of drugs and once for discharge, char, discharging a firearm. And what's your brother's name? Tad Scott. The man leaned forward the way one does when about to leave. I don't see there's much I can do to help you. You can't call around, Richard asked, just check jails and hospitals, something like that. If he was looking for a 17-year-old sister who was down here with a Christian youth group from Massachusetts, the niece of a congressman, could you make a few calls then, I asked. Yes, then I could and I probably would make a few calls. I might even give a flying fuck. He looked me in the eye. Good day, gentlemen. We watched the man shut the door behind him. What do you think, Richard asked. I think he's smarter than he looks. About my brother. I think he's dumber than he looks. Seated not far from us, having gone not completely unnoticed, but unnoticed enough, until he cleared his throat, was a short, thick man in a Hawaiian shirt. I couldn't help but overhear, he said, with a pronounced southern accent. I happen to know somebody who might be willing to help you boys out. He handed Richard a yellow slip of paper that had been torn from a pad. He was rather obvious about looking around while he talked to us. Is this a phone number, Richard asked. Yeah, this guy might be able to help you right, out right nicely. He's American. Just lives just outside the city. What is he, a private detective or something? No. He's a condontiero. A what? A soldier, I said. Richard looked at me. I've seen them in paintings, I said. So he's a mercenary, Richard said. Such an ugly word, anyway. Call him. Maybe he can offer some assistance. Get you to your brother. Do you sit here all day waiting for people like us, I asked. Yes. He went back to reading his magazine. What's, this, what's in this for you, I asked. A public service, he said. I get mine, don't you worry. Capitalism is alive and well. Richard shoved the paper into his pocket and started for the door, but, didn't, but I didn't move. I was fixated on the man in the Hawaiian shirt. Come on, Richard said. What are you looking at? I tried to see the cover of the magazine, magazine the man was reading. It was an issue of Sports Illustrated, and I could see Reggie Jackson on the cover in an Oakland A's uniform. What is it, Richard asked, pulling me away. That magazine is 10 years old. He's sitting there reading a 10-year-old sports magazine. How do you know it's 10 years old? Because it's the last time I gave a flying fuck about baseball. The guy's crazy. Let's get out of here, Richard said. I couldn't let it go. I felt strangely irritated. How do you know Reggie Jackson play? Do you know that Reggie Jackson plays the Yankees now? Hawaiian shirt looked up, me, gave, looked up at me, gave me an uninhabited smile, turned the page, and went on reading. Outside the building, a sturdy, red-faced Chris Marine informed us that if our business was done, we'd have to leave the grounds. We did. If first hours can be considered discouraging, then these were, these were, and Richard, more than I, was ready to head straight back to the airport and go home. Though it was 90 degrees and very humid. Exactly what we had left in Philadelphia, I found even the weather exotic. And I recognized my slipping, if not into adventurousness, then into some sort of state of vacation. The colors were different, more vibrant. Whether it was true or not, rich in blues, more cerulean than the blues at home, and yellows closer to mustard. I was as well taken by the stares we attracted as we were, as we were there. Even, when I, even then, I was embarrassed by both my regard and my attraction to this attention. Outside a hotel that we imagined we could afford only because of its state of disrepair, I passed coins to Richard as he tried to place a call to a number he had been given. The number he had been given in the embassy. The word written on the number, the word written by the number, was bummer, in all lowercase letters. It might have been a name or a comment. So instead, 
of asking for someone by that name, Richard merely said the word as if it were a password. Richard covered the mouthpiece and said, his name is Bummer. It didn't take much imagination to see this as a bad sign. Some guy at the embassy gave me your number. He said you might be able to help me. Before Richard could describe the situation with his brother, wait, let me get, me, let me get a pencil. I handed him a pen and he wrote on the piece of paper. He was still writing after he hung up. To me, he said, we need to rent a car. Bummer, I asked. Guy sounded scary. Richard made his voice scratchy and tried to mimic the man. Yeah, I'm the bummer. The bummer, the bummer. He continued his, in his bummer voice, don't say nothing, just come to this address, and bring me some mangoes. No shit, no shit. In the hotel, we were told of a car rental a few blocks away. A few blocks away turned out to be a short trail into an even, rough, even rougher section of the city. Trash was piled without conscience against walls and into the street. A woman who might have been a prostitute leaned against a derelict car and eyed us as, we, as possible clients, though I doubt it in retrospect. It was, ever, it was ever more likely that she saw us as casualties. There was no sign but a small gravel lot with, a, with four cars and an office with a screen door. A man sat at a steel desk, his feet up, and nodded as we entered. He was dressed in a long sleeved flannel shirt and cowboy boots in spite of the heat and ate from a box of Cracker Jack. Welcome, gringos, he said in a rehearsed voice that expanded that expended what turned out to be the extent of his English. We want to rent a car. Um, you want to rent a car? He asked in Spanish. Auto, si, Richard said. Tango qu cuatro queje. Richard and I, my Spanish is terrible, I apologize. Richard and I looked up at the late 50s Ford pickup, the battered Bel Air, the Willys Commando, and the 63 Caddy. Uh, make a choice. Richard looked at me. I think he said, pick one. The Willys, I said. Only the Cadillac works, the man said. What? What did he say? The blue one, Richard said. The man looked, shook his head. No, only the Cadillac runs. Then why did you? Richard stopped, shook his head. He looked at me and I said, if we had some bacon, we could have eggs and bacon if we had some eggs. How much for the caddy, Richard asked. Uh, 100, the man said, a day. A hundred a day, that's not bad, Richard. That's a hundred a day, that's not bad, Richard said. American dollars. Um, that's right. A hundred dollars a day, we don't have that kind of money, uh, Richard sighed. Now, we're poor, I said. The man frowned at me, and I pulled out my pockets to show him I was poor. Por favor, uh, Richard said. Fifteen, he said. Okay, Richard said. Fifteen dollars on the table. Deposit, the man said. Siento. Richard put a hundred dollars on the desk. The man did not thank him. Thank you, Richard said, and I thanked him also, and we walked out before he could change his mind. He didn't ask for our passports or our licenses, just scooped up the money and shoved it into his breast pocket and continued to eat Chris Cracker Jack. The blue one, this caddy Coupe de Ville, was a finned beast that screamed in American English when Richard cranked the engine. There was a hole in the muffler that somehow seemed necessary. Our right turn out of, out of the lot fishtailed a cloud of dust behind us, and when I looked through it, I saw Cracker Jack watching us from the doorway. We wended our way northeast out of the city into a suburb consisting of clapboard shacks and trailer homes. The bummer's trailer stood out as the nicest one on the block. It had a door. Neighbors, chickens, and a donkey studied us as we knocked on that door. Come. We entered and found a man seated, elbows on knees, on a built-in sofa against a facing wall. We might have been 30. I'm sorry. He might have been 30, but he was worn, his blonde hair thin on, his, on top of his head. His face oddly clean-shaven, the place smelled of salami and aqua velva. The dirty floral cushions curled up around his ass. Are you the bummer? Richard asked. I'm the bummer. Where are my mangoes? We didn't bring them, Richard said. I asked these motherfuckers to do one thing and they fucking forget. He said as if to someone else, one motherfucking thing. Sorry about that, Richard said. What's your name? Richard Scott. I'm trying to find my brother. Who's he? The bummer nodded toward me without actually looking at me. He your driver? My friend, Kevin, I said. I don't give half a fuck what your name is, the bummer said. I suppose not, I said. The bummer glared at me until I looked away. Like I said, I'm trying to find my brother, Richard repeated, his voice high with fear. Don't tell me, Richard Scott. <coughs> Excuse me. So tell me, Richard Scott, why do you think you, this brother of yours is in, here in El Salvador? This is where he said he'd be headed. 
And just why might he be headed here? The bummer lit a filterless camel and blew the smoke up to the ceiling. You see, I can't think of a good reason for any American young man to come down here to this goddamn motherfucking asshole of a country. You're here, I said. Yeah, I'm here, he said without looking at me. I'm here because I'm a goddamn motherfucking asshole. I'm here because I love to sweat year round. I'm here because I hate faggots like you up in the good old US of A. I'm here because I miss motherfucking Viet fucking Nam. You're a mercenary, I said. Fuck you, the bummer said when blew smoke at me. So tell me about his brother. This brother got a name, Tad. Sweet name, is he a hippie faggot like you two motherfuckers? What does he look like, tall, short, bald? He's 31, about my size. His hair is shorter, Richard looked at, Richard looked at me. He's got a tattoo on his left arm, a tiger, and some Chinese, Chinese ideograms. Ideograms, the bummer repeated and sneered. What kind of drugs is he into? Does he sell guns? What, Richard said. Come on, stupid. He ain't down here on no, he ain't no missionary come down here on the, to the third world to save grease or soul. So he's either buying drugs or selling guns. My money's on the drugs. It's probably drugs, I said. Probably, the bummer chuckled. Richard began to grow impatient. He bounced on the balls of his feet. The guy at the embassy said you would be able to help me. He's his brother, I said, trying to appeal to some inkling of dis decency in the man. He just wants to find his brother, even though he didn't, I didn't say it. I felt, like, I felt I left the word asshole hanging in the air. You got a picture? Richard pulled out a folded, folded photo from his jacket pocket and handed it to the man. The bummer didn't examine it, but placed it face down on the coffee table in front of him. What kind of drugs? The bummer asked. What is he like? Cocaine and weed, Richard responded immediately. That's what he was into before. Are you college boys? The bummer asked. We said nothing. I was confused. Do you boys go to college? Yes, I said. The bummer smiled. What do you take? He paused. In college, what do you take? I study art. The smile broadened. You're telling me that while I was sweating and pulling rat-sized leeches off my big white dick and shit in Vietnam, you were sketching naked girls in a sunny room? Every chance I got, I said. My response took him by surprise, and he smiled. His smile changed in quality. It was oddly less threatening, but it was clear that he didn't hate me less. You know how many gooks I killed over there? Want me to tell you? Richard looked at me, and I turned and, and, I turned and studied the scene outside the window. An older woman was hanging clothes on a line. A stocky young boy was pushing a small rocking chair across the yard. I smiled. I killed me around a thousand of them. Every fucking slant I saw, I killed. What do you girls think about that? About a thousand, give or take a family. I think we're in the wrong place, Richard said. I was proud of Richard in that moment, and I said, and I was more than uh, ready to leave with him. Calm the fuck down, the bummer said. Don't get your skivvies all bunched up. I can find your brother. I need to know if you got any money, though. How much money you got? About a thousand dollars, Richard said. Do you have a grand or not? He has a thousand dollars, I said. The bummer looked out the window behind Richard and me. I'll do it for a grand, but only because I like you college boys. Richard gave me a glance. I shrugged or suggested a shrug. You pay me when the job is done, the bummer said. How does that sound? Come back here tomorrow morning at 7, and we'll get started. You girls know how to wake up early? We'll manage it, I said. About you, the bummer said, pointing his cigarette at me. Yeah, I said. Don't think I didn't notice you're a nigger. I was afraid you missed that fact. I'm just saying, I kill me some of you over there, too, and, um, you know, when nobody was looking. A lot of motherfuckers over there, he smiled. Of course you did. I doubt you could kill anything while somebody was looking. We'll be back in the morning, Richard said. He grabbed me by my shoulder and pushed me out the door. Good, now go squeeze out that morning wood and be here on fucking time. Okay, and stuff happens. Um, the fog had not burned off an hour later when we took the turn off the same road we had traveled the previous day. I was driving, and the bummer was in the passenger seat, leaning forward, peering through the haze. His attitude was different again, even more serious, nervous, pensive, and charged, perhaps a little frightened. I can see a little better now, I said. We just stop here anyway and walk, the bummer said. He pointed to the shell of a shack. As we got closer and the fog grew thinner, I could see that the shack was only two walls, each leaning into and supporting the other. The wood was old and gray, growing darker and browner near the ground, where several boards were pried loose. 
A couple of bright green, laurel green parrots sat on top of a one wall, side by side facing us. They didn't fly away as we drew close and I wondered closer and I wondered if birds could fly in the fog, whether they were grounded. The bummer stood directly beneath the birds and pointed the muzzle of his black rifle at them. Bang, he said. He turned and smiled at us. Easy hunting. Anybody hungry? We're good, Richard said. I was surprised by how much relief I felt when he did not pull the trigger. I then realized just how tense my body had become. I tried to focus my, on my breathing so that I could keep breathing. We walked on past the two walls and onto to a trail that led down a hill through a stand of trees. It was damp in the thickly wooded area, but strangely warmer. Monkeys made sounds far off and parrots and other birds were calling more and more. I was several yards behind the bummer and Richard was crowding up behind me. Another goose chase, Richard asked, probably. I hope there's some food wherever we're going. I looked back at Richard and sighed, you owe me big time. I looked back at the bummer's head. I discovered that I did not like the shape of it. Bummer, where are you taking us? Uh, fill us in on your method if you wouldn't mind. The bummer stopped. His shoulders sagged and he sighed. He turned around and looked at us, at me. I'm trying to find your friend's brother, he said evenly. How? If the missing boy is into drugs, then I have to check out some places. What kind of places, Richard asked. Drug kind of places. What do you know? Not much, right? Just let me do my job. The trail ended a, <clears throat> at a narrow, yellowish dirt road, soaked from the rain. It was rutted and looked more like an old wagon trail, but it was well scarred with the tracks of trucks. This way, the bummer said, and he led us along the lane. I had long ago lost any inkling of direction. With the fogginess, I could not even tell where the sun had come up. It, was, it started to drizzle, then it rained harder. The water beat down on us. It rolled through my hair and out onto my face, which I had to keep wiping away with my hand. Ahead of us, there were several huts, and behind them, a couple of houses, a village. Is this a village, I asked. The bummer held his fist up by his head and crouched as he moved toward the right side of the road. He was standing in an ankle, an ankle deep puddle, but didn't seem to care or even notice. He held his M16 differently now, his right hand on the trigger housing, but his finger away from the trigger. He walked slowly on and we followed. I noticed a smell in the air, a burnt something, sulfur, a trace of ammonia. The hair on my, on my neck stood on end. Ahead of us, in the middle of the muddy road, there appeared to be a garment, a sack, a red sweater. Closer, it looked like a doll, but only momentarily. The middle of it was sunk down into the mud. There were little feet, one foot dressed in a sock and a shoe. The face was turned away from us. The bummer stood erect and turned in a circle to see all around us, his finger tapping the trigger now. What the fuck, I said, and I started scanning the area. There was no sign of anyone. What the fuck is this? I was staring at bummer, at the bummer, but he was paying no attention to me. He was peering down and up the lane and at the buildings. That's a kid, Richard said. I nodded. I turned to see the body again, and now I couldn't look away. Her blood was black mixed in the mud, making a black and mustard soup, and she seemed to have been split in two like a magician's act. That's a kid, Richard said again. Again, I nodded. What the hell is going on? I asked the bummer. Shut the fuck up, he said. Keep your fucking eyes open. Where is everybody? I asked. There was a lot of shooting here, the bummer said. Smell that powder, ammonia, and that stench. 223, smell it, soldiers. Soldiers, Richard said, Christ. The three of us jumped when we heard a clang, like a kicked pail from behind a hut. My instinct was, it was to get low, and so I took a knee. But that put me closer to the dead child, a girl. Her dress was blue, and her skin was the color of mine, and she was framed by the stew her life had left in the mud. Her left hand was missing, an absence made more pronounced by the fact that her other hand had been washed clean by the rain and looked still alive. Richard stood behind the bummer. Who was there? A small man a very little, and a very little boy walked out from behind the shack. They were shaking, soaked, unarmed. The bummer lowered his rifle. He motioned for them to come closer, which they did. Where's everybody, the bummer asked the man. The man shook his head, tried to steal a peek at the body in the road. Donde esta Carlos, the bummer snapped his fingers in the man's face to get his attention. Carlos, no sé. Fuck, the bummer said with one, to no one in particular. He looked at the dead girl and back at the man. 
your daughter, see, in his, it, it's his kid, Richard said to me, and to himself. Together, we stood staring down at the girl. The man was crying, but making no sound. The boy was wide-eyed, silent, struck. He could have been four or a tiny seven, I didn't know. Then the man fell to pieces, sinking to his knees. He covered his face with his muddy hands. He reached over and pulled the boy to him. Let's get the fuck out of here before whoever did this comes back, the bummer said. I looked at Richard. I had never seen him truly afraid before. What are we supposed to do, I asked. Richard couldn't speak. We're supposed to get the fuck out of here, the bummer said. The little man got up and walked over, and walked over to the outside wall of a nearby hut and grabbed a spade. He walked in a circle looking, looking at the ground until he found a spot and started digging. The rain fell harder. Let's go, the bummer said. I didn't respond to him. I walked over and grabbed a square shovel from the same wall and joined the man in digging. Richard came and took the spade from the father and he and I dug the grave together. You guys are fucking idiots, the bummer said. He sat on a metal chair that had been left outside and kept watch. He kept saying fuck every few minutes. Hurry the fuck up. He lit a cigarette and, and, and smoked in the rain. Fuck. What are we doing here, Richard asked me. I tossed dirt out of the hole. The only thing we can do, we can do. I, I didn't know what, <clears throat> I didn't know if what I said was true. I didn't know if we were doing the right thing and frankly, I didn't care. I knew only that I had to do something and that was dig. I wanna go home. Don't you wanna go home, Richard asked. I'm assuming that's rhetorical. Hurry the fuck up, the bummer shouted. We kept digging, the wet earth offering no dust until we were about a foot down. The digging became increasingly difficult, and we got deeper, as we got deeper and the color of the soil changed, became redder and rockier. There was a splinter between my thumb and forefinger, but I didn't care. I kept digging. I focused on the digging because I didn't want to consider the child, the father. I was crying when the man carried his daughter in pieces to the grave. He had taken off his yellow shirt and wrapped it around her head and covered her face. The wet fabric clung to her and I could still see her tiny features. I felt as if um, I had an ice lance and my ice was in my stomach. We didn't touch her, but let the man lay his daughter on the floor of the hole we'd made. The man took the spade from Richard and tossed in some dirt. He looked at me and added some more. I helped him cover her. My hands were trembling the whole time but the work, using the shovel, moving the dirt, then studied them. When the grave was about half full, and a grave is never half empty, I noticed that the rain had stopped. I leaned on the shovel to rest. I looked at the sliver deep in my flesh. The boy came to me, offered me something, confused me. Then I realized that he was giving me his sister's left hand. It was not, it was not, it had not made it into the grave, but must have been lost in the mud and the blood puddle. His shirt was cobalt blue. The severed hand was fairly blue black. There was no red to be seen, as if blood was never red. The father did not see me take the hand. In my own hand, the piece of person felt like a feather, a wet nothing. Before the man turned to see it, I dropped it in the grave and covered it. Richard didn't see what had happened. The bummer was quietly sitting guard, smoking another cigarette. I shared this with the boy and the boy alone. I was never told his name, but in my mind, in my story, in my world, his name was Luis. Thank you.